Chunk 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 Hey everybody, welcome back to Practical MDO with me, John Yasa. I'm wearing my glasses today. I, I showed the last lesson to my dad, and he suggested wearing my glasses to appear smarter. So here I am. I hope you can't see too much glare. Today we're talking about using groups to organize models. If you've been watching these videos as they come out on YouTube, know that this is one of the topics that is less advanced than some of the others. This is one of the more basic topics. When I'm talking about using groups to organize your models, I'm talking about where should parts of the models, systems and subsystems, live within your model. How should you organize them, where should the variables go, and how should they be connected? So because this is a relatively basic idea and it's definitely focused on model construction, we'll jump right into it. First, I'll walk through some of the basics of groups in OpenMDO, and then I'll give some kind of tips and guidelines for some best practices and things that I've seen work well across different systems engineering problems. So first, let's cover some of the basics. In OpenMDO, you could instantiate three components, kind of using the code shown here. Here we have the model block, which is instantiated first by saying openmdo.problem model equals group. Groups here are shown in green and components are shown in blue. We can have one, two, three components, as I show here. These all live at the same level. Another way to arrange three components here, instead of a flat way, is to have components one and two live within a group. Then this group can live within the model level, and component three can also live at that model level. You can have any kind of heterogeneous hierarchy that you want. If it helps you organize and understand and share your model, it's a great idea to use it. The idea of how many groups you should have is something we'll cover later on in this lesson. Now, some people like this tree view of the groups, but let me show you another view of the exact same system. So here we have the model, and it's kind of a, a nesting doll situation. Then we have group one within this model, and within group one, components one and two. Again, this is the exact same kind of simple model I just showed in the tree view, but now in this nesting doll situation. So then we have component three also within the model here. Okay, so after looking at the tree view in this kind of nesting doll, let's take a look at an n square diagram for this exact same model. Here we have components one and two, again, as part of group one, and component three at that model level. OpenMDO produces these N2 diagrams, and I have different lessons on using them, but this is exactly the same model as I was showing before. Some people like looking at the tree view, others like looking at the nesting doll, others like looking at the N-squared diagram. I think it's great to look at the N-squared diagram, again, because that's something that OpenMDO produces automatically, and it can really help you understand very complex models quickly. So now that we have the extreme basics of groups and what I mean by that in OpenMDO, let's talk about maybe some ideas about what the best size for a group is. Here I have some tips, and these are subjective. They're certainly not set in stone. They're not objective. There's no right or wrong answer here. But these are some tips that I'm going to say. I'm going to say that groups should probably have, you know, two to ten subgroups or components, and then each one of these components can have five to thirty variables. Again, this is very problem dependent. I'm suggesting some of these as kind of rough guidelines, but if you have something that inherently involves, say, 50 variables for one component and it just cannot be broken up, it's okay to have more than 30. But that being said, I think this is kind of a, a helpful set of guidelines to look at your model, critically examine, hey, can I make this more readable? Can I make this more understandable by grouping up these 10 variables together, taking this out of a, a one component, and putting it into a different component, and, and grouping these other groups together? It's kind of tough to understand what this means without having some examples, so I'll go into a brief example later on in this lesson, but then also have more examples of systems engineering groups in another linked lecture that will be in the description below. So the reason why I suggest kind of these group and component sizes is that it helps you obtain derivatives more easily. If you have a component that has 100 inputs and 100 outputs, oh my gosh, it can be really tough to understand how to compute the derivatives. However, if you have, you know, maybe five, 10 variables in there, it's a little bit easier to write down some of these derivative expressions. Additionally, if you have one huge flat model with many different variables that live at the top level, it will probably be challenging to understand how they should be interacting together. However, if you have different groups and these groups are kind of broken out by disciplines or, or subsystems, it's much easier to understand your model. Not only can others understand your model more easily, but you can too. Now, let me just walk through a few examples here of what I mean by groups, right? Because you may be thinking, well, should, should a discipline always be a group or, or should a physical system be a group? That's a great place to start. I really like starting there. So here I say that, you know, top level groups should be maybe subsystems or disciplinary models. 
Here's an example. We have a model. Again, we're showing groups in green here. Then we have aerodynamics, structures, and propulsion. These are those top level groups. Maybe here you're doing like an aerostructural propulsive analysis of an aircraft. Then within any one of these top level groups, we can have additional nested groups here shown in green and, and with these Gs, or other components here with, shown in blue with Cs. I'm just showing it here for the structures, not for every single top level group, but just know that you, know, you can have as many arbitrarily nested groups or components as you want in a model. Here I'm kind of advocating you to say, okay, my top level groups should be disciplinary breakdowns. They should be something I can point to and say, okay, this is where the structural analysis happens. This is where the propulsive analysis happens. You can connect variables to and from these groups from that top level. It makes it a little bit easier to understand what's going on in your model if you can point to a group and say, this is the nugget of the model that is being represented here. Now, another tip I have here, and it's again a guideline, but it's gonna help you, is making reusable groups. When I say reusable groups, I mean something that you can take from one model, one analysis, one optimization, and use it in another. Here is an example, and it's one where there's a group below the structural level. And this is some subgroup, maybe it's computing the, the mass of the wing or something like that, and we can use it in another section of the model. Maybe the formulas for computing some of the structural properties of the wing can also be used in the fuselage. And we care about this when we're computing the weights, for instance. This is kind of just a, a real simple example, but the idea is if we have one subgroup here, which has some inputs and outputs to this group, we can reuse it in other places, maybe for this model, maybe for a larger multidisciplinary model, maybe just for a smaller model, just that group alone. But I'm really encouraging you to take a look at the groups you're constructing, how they're using components, how they're using those variables, and thinking about reusability. You definitely don't want to sit down, make something that's a one-off for this one project, and throw it away at the end of the project. You want to make something that you can reuse, something that's useful to not only you but other people, so that when somebody says, hey, do you still have that 12 degree of freedom beam structural solver? You can say, yes, here it is in OpenMDO. I'm going to pass it off to you. It's one group. Here are the inputs and outputs. You can use it for whatever you're doing. It's so valuable to save developer time that way, and it's so valuable to say, hey, I've already done this. I know that it works and that it works well. I can reuse it elsewhere. So here's kind of a closing statement. I'm saying that purposefully formulating your groups to be reusable, understandable, and reasonably sized makes it very easy to write large and complicated MDO problems. You can imagine if you have a thousand variables at the top level, and it's going to be tough to understand what's going on there. But if you have 10 groups of 10 variables and you stamp these out in different ways, all of a sudden that becomes much more comprehensible. So here I'm really suggesting take a look at your model. Take a look at how you could group it so that you can understand it better, you can use it for other models, and that you can pass it off to others. Again, I want to stress this is just one very basic idea of using groups to organize models. There are so many intricacies and details. This is really kind of the intro lesson. I highly suggest you check out other lessons, especially the examples of system engineering problems, uh, to kind of see what actual groups look like for different analyses and optimizations that we've done. As always, please hit those like and subscribe buttons if you've liked what you've seen. And guys, gals, and non-binary pals, thanks for watching. Bye.